<laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Abby, and welcome back to the Asheville Museum of Science Ask a Scientist series. Today, we have with us Dr. Sophie McCoy, who is a assistant professor in the Department of Biology at um, the Coastal and Marine Lab at Florida State University. So she is where we all wish we were in Florida. Um, I was just telling her it is definitely winter in my office this morning, um, but prior to joining the faculty at FSU, she earned her degree from the University of Chicago, um, and she completed a lot of research uh, learning about e marine ecosystems, ecosystem resilience, and she has more recently started using algae as like sort of an indicator species. So she's going to be talking with us today about that, and I will pass it off to you, Dr. McCoy. Thank you so much, and everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited. Uh, to be talking with you. Um, and I also have some, some slides prepared for more of a visual. Um, I know that helps me pay attention, especially online. So I'm just gonna load those up to share with you. All right, great. Um, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to talk with you all today about climate change in marine environments, and we're gonna mostly be talking about algae. Um, okay, and I've put on here um, email um, and my Twitter handle in case anyone has follow up questions later, uh, please don't be shy about asking me about them. Uh, but first, you've heard a little bit about me and so I was just curious where everyone is logging in from today. Um, I don't know how easy it is for you to get that information to me. <laughs> I can tell you we have one from New Hampshire, cool. one from Massachusetts, and then some from North Carolina, of course. Of course. <laughs> awesome. At this, at this stage. Thank you. Um, awesome. So we've got a little geographic spread. Um, I think that's the silver lining of all this online stuff is that it's just as easy to connect with people who are far away than um, you know people who are actually your neighbors. <laughs> I don't know if that's overall a good thing, but um, but it is nice to feel a bit closer in sort of how the world is today. All right, I keep getting thrown off because I can't use um, the same process to change my slides as normal. My computer gives me that angry sound, um, so it keeps throwing me off. All right, and one more question for you, and then we won't need our interpreter anymore. Um, but I was just curious, how do all of you typically learn about the environment, about climate, um, climate change? Do you read the newspaper, watch documentaries, maybe on Netflix, um, talk to your friends? And as I wait for those to come in, I'll get, like, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about research that we're doing in my lab um, at the university, um, which um, is sort of an earlier stage. What you read about in the newspaper is is usually like the consensus of a lot of people's research. And so what I'm gonna tell you is just one piece of the puzzle. And then what you read about in the newspaper or see on a documentary is like the zoomed out completed puzzle. I was gonna say, I think a lot of it is documentaries at this point, because everyone's at home watching Netflix, especially. Yeah. Um, and we have like our planet and planet earth and all those. So I think that's um, a huge source of it. Yeah, and there are some, gorgeous documentaries on Netflix. Um, really, really pretty. And also, I don't know if any of you have gotten into Disney Plus recently. Um, we've been watching it, especially um, I'll dork ourselves right now. We've been watching the Mandalorian series, which has gotten us to sign up for Disney Plus. But there's a lot of National Geographic documentaries on there too um, that have been fun. All right. Um, so, um, you know what? What we do in my research lab um, is we think about sort of how do we overlap chemistry, physiology, which physiology is like what happens inside of your body or inside of one animal's body, um, and ecology, which is like the what, how do different organisms and types of animals and plants interact out in the ecosystem. And so um, differences in our physiology, so how each individual or each kind of, of animal responds to climate is sort of what, what underlies when we talk about change in an ecosystem, um, right? So I know like when, when it's hot outside, 
I know it happens to me. I get slow. I get lazy and sluggish, but actually my metabolism speeds up and processes food a lot faster. Um, and so that affects how I interact with other people. Um, and it also interact, affects how I interact with my environment. And so how do we scale that up um, sort of as the, the intersection of, of this Venn diagram here? So that's what we focus on in my research group at, um, at Florida State. All right, and so this is something that is famous in the science community, but I don't know um, if it's famous, you know, not the Kardashian of science. Uh, so I'll walk you through it a little bit, but it's what we call the Keeling curve, and it's named after the scientist who started making these observations in the 1950s. Um, and he was just measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So carbon dioxide is actually when we breathe out, that's what we breathe out. Um, but it's really a common um, gas in a lot of our emissions from factories, from cars, et cetera. And so um, while it sort of accumulates naturally in the atmosphere and it's, it's in air naturally, um, we've been sort of playing with the balance of how much there is. And so since he started measuring that in, um, I think, 1958, um, it's been going up pretty quickly. Um, and steadily from then until now. So you can actually download this at the, the website that I'm putting up right here. Um, and they update it every day. Um, and they actually measure it. Um, so they measure it daily. And what you can see the sort of zigzag pattern is what we call the earth breathing. And so in the summer, when there's a lot of plants and a lot of seaweed making oxygen, it actually we use carbon dioxide. Well, I said we, I am not a plant. Uh, but plants use carbon dioxide to um, do photosynthesis, which, which makes oxygen that we breathe. Um, and then in the winter, right, when a lot of the leaves have fallen from trees, um, there's actually more respiration going on on the planet. And so that's when we see the carbon dioxide spike. So that um, zigzag is the seasonal cycle of, of our planet, the productivity on our planet. All right, and we can extend that back in the more time using ice core data. So, um, sorry, I forgot to say this Mauna Loa data set, this part that I showed you before, um, is measured in Hawaii at the Mauna Loa volcano. So it's just a really tall peak um, that's isolated from nearby human activity. Um, and so that's, that's why the observatory was set up there. Um, and then combine that with ice core data where there are bubbles in the ice um, that preserve what air was like at whatever year it was that the ice formed. Um, they can radiocarbon date the ice and then use the gas, measure the gas inside to reconstruct what the atmosphere was like before. And so we have some of those measurements that take us back to before the Industrial Revolution. And so you can sort of see as, as industries picked up, um, we can match this with that timeline, um, historical timeline and see that we really are accelerating the rate um, that we get carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Right? And so we can zoom out even more, um, again, using ice core data. Um, and so we can really see like, yes, there's a baseline of accumulating carbon dioxide here, but what's going on recently um, is this crazy spike that we're seeing here um, more recently. So the, the previous graph I showed you ended here, and then now we're just getting more and more context for that. Um, and so this baseline is when you hear people talk about we're coming out of the ice age and so like everything's getting warmer and the greenhouse gases are accumulating. This is what they're talking about. And that is an accumulation. It's just not on the same scale um, as what's happening from industrial emissions. All right. So um, and again, I'm talking a little bit about like where that's coming from. And so here's um, let me move this box here so you can see that this is an EPA report um, that came out. Actually, I think that came out um, just a couple years ago. So so during um, the current presidential administration is when this EPA report came out that I'm showing you on the top. And then on the bottom here, um, I'm showing you a graph from the International Panel on Climate Change report, which was in 2014. Um, and so we're showing different kinds of greenhouse gases here. The CO2 um, carbon dioxide I've been talking to you about is in the green up here. Um, but there's also methane and nitrous oxide, which you might have heard of. So nitrous oxide 
um, comes from a lot of coal plants and methane comes from a lot of different places. Um, if you've been hearing about um, cows farting, <laughs> that's a source of methane. Um, but more commonly, it's as the Arctic areas have these old bogs and marshes that have been frozen for thousands of years. And as those thaw out, um, bogs are just naturally produce a lot of methane as plant material degrades. And so that's actually most of the methane we're seeing. It's actually not from agriculture. It's from um, permafrost in the Arctic that's starting to melt. And so those bogs are getting chemically active again, um, which is their normal state when they're not frozen. And then here on the bottom, we're just seeing different um, sources of carbon dioxide specifically. Um, and, and a little bit, um, they're saying here nitrous oxide um, is similar. I'm just not showing you that graph because I don't really want to talk about nitrogen today. I want to talk about carbon. Um, so fossil fuels is this gray bar. And then forestry and other land use is also contributing to that. All right. Um, so that's all the background that I'm giving you. And you'll understand why now. Um, so all these emissions go in the atmosphere, but actually about a third of them dissolve in the ocean. And so we call that ocean acidification. Um, and when this was discovered, like around 2004, 2005, people were very excited about it because we thought this is great. The ocean is taking care of a third of this problem and it's reducing the rate that this is accelerating like temperature change and, and all of that. Um, and as you know, it's sort of an out of sight, out of mind problem. So for a long time, we were like, this is super, this is great. Like it's just going in that water and we don't have to think about it. Um, but it turns out you probably heard about all like the trash in the, in the oceans that we're discovering, right? And so more recently, um, there are more restrictions on what you can dump in the ocean because it turns out that when you do go underwater and you look at it and see what's going on, um, it's not such good news. So why is that? All right. So this is the most sciencey slide that I have. You can mentally check out for a couple of minutes if you want to, but I'm going to try and walk you through it so everyone stays with us. All right. And if you haven't seen this since like middle school science, that's fine. All right. Carbon dioxide combines with water. So that's what happens in the ocean. And it makes what we call um, carbonic acid. All right, this is actually the same acid that we have in our blood because it's really good at keeping pH from getting totally out of control. But it can lose one proton to make bicarbonate and it can lose a second proton to make um, carbonate. All right, let's decipher, like, what did I just say? All right, so I know here in Tallahassee, we have um, horrible, sorry, I should have changed that. I <laughs> was, I gave this talk to my high school um, and so um, I forgot to change that. But if you haven't seen this as high school, um, you're totally wrong. If you've cleaned your kettle or your bathroom like ever. Um, so we've got really, really um, limey water here in Tallahassee. And so my tea kettle is disgusting all the time in my shower. I have to clean it like every week to get rid of the lime scale. And so you could use vinegar, which is actually an acid with water to deal with that. You could put in lemons which have citric acid to descale your tea kettle, or you could use baking soda. So it turns out baking soda is um, bicarbonate, okay? And then these weak acids are lowering the pH of the water and dissolving that line scale away. So this is exactly what's happening in the ocean. Um, when you've got extra CO2 in there that's making um, this carbonic acid, it's just like you're adding some lemon, some acid in to descale. When you're in a system here um, at a pH around seven, which is neutral pH, what the ocean should be, um, it's a bicarbonate system. And so you get chunks of bicarbonate um, at the, on the sea floor, whatever. Um, and then here, when you've got a really high pH, or, um, so it's a basic system, that's when you get deposits of calcium carbonate or lime scale, just like um, hopefully this isn't exactly what your shower head looks like. This is not mine. I got this picture off the internet. Um, but I think we've all seen this at some point. <laughs> all right, so let's translate this into biology. Um, right, so when the pH is low and we don't have these solid materials, that favors plants that actually use carbon dioxide, just like trees, in photosynthesis. And then when at a higher pH, 
that's really good for animals like these mussels or corals, um, things that make calcium carbonate skeletons. So that's called calcification, the process of making that skeleton. Um, so I'll pause here in case anyone has questions about this background info, um, but we're not gonna talk too much about chemistry for the rest of it. Don't worry. I know nobody likes the chemistry part. I was gonna say, it's pretty quiet through the chemistry parts. Uh, yeah, okay, all right, that's <laughs> fine. We'll get to um, the cool part, which is the biology, and then you'll be glad you know the chemistry. <laughs> Okay, so what happens when we offset the balance between these two things? So I just told you that ocean acidification is affecting the balance between car um, carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, and carbonate, and that those are basically like nutrients that are being used um, by different parts of the marine ecosystem, different organisms living in there. Um, so why, what happens and why do we care about that? Or why did I just tell you about all this chemistry? <laughs> so here's the project excuse me, that I've been working on with mussels um, from Washington State. So we got corals, mussels, other animals with carbonate skeletons. They're going to make less skeleton when there's when it's more acidic. So just like your tea kettle, it's harder for them to hold on to that line scale. Um, that's basically what their skeleton is made out of when the pH goes down um, as we add more carbon dioxide into the ocean. So this is a mussel shell. I sliced it in half. So if you got the shell, I sliced it in half like this um, into a little thin slice. Um, and that's what it looks like. And they have growth rings just like, like trees, like tree rings. And so we can measure the overall thickness of the shell, but we can also measure the thickness of a year's growth in the shell like that. And so at um, two different places out in Washington State, um, these are coastal areas where um, there are very old Native American settlements there. They were summer fishing camps. And so there actually are um, midden archives. So these are sort of a lot of like, like kitchen um, waste and heat. So there are a lot of shells that were preserved in those sediments there. And so we actually worked with some archaeologists um, from the Macaw tribe who um, who had a lot of these mussel shells preserved and were really generous in letting us use them and, and slice some of them up. And so we're able to see that the mussel shells between that time, so um, up to 663 AD or um, to 1000 AD are the oldest shells that we had. And they were about twice as thick as they are today, both overall um, and also each year of growth. So it's not just like, oh, they're twice as old and they had twice the number of growth rings. It's actually that every year they grew twice as thick. And so that added up. So they're about the same age as the shells we're looking at now, um, but they just have these massive shells. Okay. And so when we look inside the shell, so this is way, way, way zoomed in on the microscope. Um, this is what you see. All right, so let me... <laughs> Tell you what you're looking at. They're kind of psychedelic. Um, so we're zoomed in to where this red region is on the shell. And where you see these like darker bands, um, that's in the winter where they're, it's colder, so they're growing slowly. And in the summer, they make these huge, nice big crystals. So you sort of see the outline of each crystal in gray. And then the colors tell you how they're oriented. So they're all lined up. They're lined up like this. And if they're blue or green, that means that they're twisting like that. But they're basically, they're all lined up in the same way, in the same pattern over time. All right, so this is what a healthy mussel shell looks like. Cool. Um, and so when we look at the most recent shells, so these were ones collected between 2010 and 2015, um, we see that they are, they just look really strikingly different visually. Um, so what do the colors mean? So I told you that the blue and green is this kind of rotation. When they get pink and yellow, it means they're starting to like rotate. However, so it's like pick up sticks. Um, I don't know if you've ever played that game or maybe not for a long time, but when you drop them and they are all over the place, um, you know, just sort of scattered and not organized in a particular way um, compared to like the really organized person who has like a pencil case and all their pencils are lined up nicely. Um, and we can see that they're also really variable. Um, so this shell looks like 
pretty okay, right? Um, I'll go back one slide so you can, it looks really similar to what we're seeing in these healthy shells. And some of them just look like whatever is going on, they have these cracks or they maybe they got stressed and they stopped growing and then they started growing again. Um, and what you're seeing here with this pink and yellow is what we call amorphous calcium carbonate. So we can't actually give it the name of a mineral. So it's not carbonate, it's not calcite, um, it's just the right um, chemical components are there, but to have a mineral, it needs to be organized in a specific way and it's just not doing that. This is very similar to what we see in scar tissue. So I don't know if you've ever picked up maybe on the beach, um, a shell and it had like a, like a scar, it looks just like scar on our skin. And they're just trying to fix that really quickly. And so that's actually what scar tissue looks like. I think there's a question from the audience. Yeah, so if we, so if uh, they are not forming those, those minerals that they're supposed to be making in the shell, um, are they bonding at all? Or is there, are they just like, not even interacting? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so they're, they're still like a solid material. So they're loosely bonded, but they're not in a strong mineral structure. Um, and it's interesting because when you look at the shell, not on the microscope, just with the naked eye, they look normal. They look completely normal, um, which is actually super interesting because um, there are different kinds of calcium carbonate minerals. So there's aragonite, there's calcite, there's dolomite, and visually those can look very different. Um, but when I'm, I look at the shells, I don't, they don't look different to me at all. Um, it's only when you look at this really fine scale that you see, um, yeah, the mineral organization. And so what that can mean also is um, not that the, the chemical components aren't bonded to each other, but just that the bonds are really distorted. And so instead of being here, they're like, they're here. So they're stretched out and just not as strong. Great question. Thanks. Um, and I'll also note here in presentation mode, I have no idea what time it is. So if, um, if I talk too much, which is something that I do, um, just wave me down. <laughs> All right, so um, I promised I was gonna talk to you about algae and I haven't done that very much yet. So now I will. I just wanted to give that context of, you know, why we're worried about ocean acidification um, because actually algae is super happy about everything that is happening, right? So there's increased carbon availability and that, like I told you, algae uses that for photosynthesis um, to grow and to produce oxygen. And it also means that it can take advantage of other nutrients that are in excess um, in a lot of coastal systems like nitrogen and phosphorus. Those can come from agricultural runoff or even from septic tank leakage. Um, so here are three things that have been in the news that some of you may remember. Um, this first picture from, um, from Shindao in China was taken before the Olympics. I don't know if anyone remembers this. It was, gosh, it was over 10 years ago now, uh, but there were these massive headlines as China was preparing to host all these tourists coming in for the Summer Olympics, and they had this massive algal bloom on all their public beaches, and it was embarrassing for them, right? And it was just anomalously warm water that summer combined with, you know, this is a big city, um, combined with a lot of nutrient runoff from land. And so this is, you know, something that happens clearly fairly often. This family just had a great day at the beach, right? And imagine showing up to the beach and it looked like this. I'm like, well, I wouldn't because it's my research. I'd probably get out of my sample bags, but most people would probably get right back in the car and drive home. Um, and actually before the Olympics, there were thousands of volunteers collecting algae and shoving it in trash bags um, to, to clear it up. Another more recent thing um, that you might have seen on the news, 2018 in Florida, at least we had awful problems with cyanobacterial blooms and also with red tide. It was just algal blooms all over the place. This is the Florida Keys that are supposed to have this beautiful crystal clear water and coral reefs. Um, this is a helicopter image of just this nasty cyanobacterial bloom coming in. Um, and cyanobacterial blooms and also red algal blooms, red tide, they can um, create these, they're, they're called harmful algal blooms. Um, 
in contrast to something like this, which is sea lettuce blooming, which is like, you know, whatever, there's no health consequence. It's just slimy and gross. Um, and it smothers everything living under it. Where cyanobacteria, they'll compete with each other and to try and get a leg up, they make all these toxic compounds and to deter things from eating them. And so they're neurotoxins that even can get aerosolized into the air. So you, you could breathe them in and have, have to go to the hospital, have some um, lung inflammation and stuff. And so the last example is sort of coral reefs of today. There's this algae versus coral thing going on. Um, and the algae will, you know, when they're having these bloom conditions, they'll just grow all over the place and smother what's living under them. So things like coral that are already endangered with, um, especially in the, here in the Florida Keys, we've got coral diseases and, and other um, issues going on. It's just sort of icing on the cake, I guess, literally icing on a cake you don't want to eat um, and, and making everything just a little bit worse. And so this was a very common, oops, this is a very common sign that we had posted here in Florida um, the last two summers um, because there are the, those health issues with the, the blooms, cyanobacterial blooms, right? So don't wade, swim, um, or swallow, especially swallow. So if you're like water skiing or something, and this can be freshwater or marine systems, if there's a bloom going on, um, even just like breathing in, if you're on a boat and there's, you know, there's some spray going on, you could breathe that in and a week, not even realize it. And a week later, if you have these severe, like severe cold and cough symptoms, um, it might not be COVID, it could be cyanobacterial um, toxins. So um, one more thing to worry about, but there are no blooms going on right now and definitely not in North Carolina because it's, it's a bit colder for them. So um, in the clear. All right, so in my research, the main thing I'm interested in um, is identifying mechanisms, right? So how, how can we retain the function of ecosystems? They're changing. There's clearly these big scale changes that um, we could prevent them, but we'd have to, to really drastically change our lifestyle. And, and that's, you know, potentially very unrealistic, clearly, because we're not doing it. Um, and it'd be you know, some, some really dramatic changes, even for those of us like me who are like, yeah, we need to change our behavior. That doesn't mean I don't want to use my heat or air conditioning ever, you know, or watch TV or do any of these things that use electricity. Electricity is really important and it's what's connecting us today. Um, so what other controls are there maybe naturally in systems that have been disrupted and how can we try to leverage those? Okay. So um, cyanobacteria on reefs, they are all over reefs. Um, so here in these pictures are this red stuff that you see. And this one, they're this uh, mustard colored thing that you see. And then this bottom one, it's like that mint colored thing. Um, so while they're blue green algae, they're not always the same color. Um, and that's just because they're different kinds of them. And there are also a lot of other organisms that might live together in like a, a, a film together with them that'll affect the color. Um, but if you ever see something that's sort of like wispy, a little gross, you're not sure if you want to touch it or not, um, it's probably a cyanobacterial uh, mat. And so this is an article that came out two years ago. It's called Reefs Under Siege, right? And it's all about like what's going on with these, these cyanobacterial mats. And it, research on them has really focused on the causes. So you know, high nutrient flow to coral reefs, warmer water temperatures, ocean acidification is a big one. That's what I um, sort of hammered into you at the beginning of this talk. Um, and so all of these things sort of happening together are the perfect storm. And so, like I said, all the research until now has been focused on what's causing these things and how can we stop causing them? And so in my research group, we're taking a slightly different approach. We're saying, okay, there's a lot of stuff causing them. We know pretty much what it is, but there's a limited amount we can do about it. So how can we explore ways to get rid of them? And so I think I measured, I mentioned, right, the toxins um, for humans, they're also toxic to all vertebrates. And so especially in the Caribbean, we thought that nothing could eat them. In the Florida Keys, nobody has ever seen a fish eating a cyanobacterial mat. Um, and reefs in the Florida Keys are very polluted and doing really badly. So we actually went 
Um, two summers ago, we went to the South Caribbean, an island called Bonaire, which is part of the Netherlands. Um, and Bonaire, so Bonaire, Curacao, and Aruba are all the way, the southernmost islands in the Caribbean. And they're actually, they're like complete deserts on the top. So you think about the Caribbean maybe as being these like lush, tropical, forested, whatever, palm trees everywhere areas. And these three islands in the south are, it's like being in Arizona on land, and then you've got a coral reef underwater, which is very beautiful, but I think explains why they've stayed a little bit more pristine than islands like the Bahamas. They have historically attracted less, fewer tourists and less development. And so we went there because they're supposed to be the most pristine reefs in the Caribbean, and we wanted to see in what like a normal system that's not super polluted, what's going on? Because there are cyanobacteria. These are all pictures from Bonaire. So the cyanobacteria are there, but they're not taking over the reef. So why not? Um, and what's controlling them? And so we found that fish, um, at least six different kinds of fish are eating the mats. Um, and so these are, um, these are them, um, angelfish, tangs, parrotfish. The rock beauty is actually a kind of angelfish as well, this guy. Um, so they're eating the mats. And, and that's, I don't know, that's pretty cool. We were really shocked. And a lot of people didn't believe us because most people have been looking at polluted reefs. Um, and so we also wanted to know, so I'll go back. We also wanted to know, right, are they, okay, so we've got, we've caught them in the act. They're eating. But I've tasted all sorts of stuff that I do not make myself for dinner, right? <laughs> I just don't really want to eat again. So are they tasting it or are they actually eating it as like a, a food source that they're eating a, a significant amount? So they're consuming it. So we looked at of all the bites. We're here we're just focusing on the angelfish and a parrotfish. And we're looking at out of all the bites that they eat. And the red are the, the cyanobacterial mats. Um, what proportion of bites are actually on them. So they seem to like just regular algae the best, this green, um, fine, that's what we expect, but they're actually eating a fair amount, especially the French angelfish. They're like a third of what they're biting are cyanobacterial mats. And then this next thing I'm showing you is how many bites in a row they took. So like they tasted it and then we're like, yeah, okay, that's good, I'm gonna keep eating it. And so we thought that would be a measure of, did they taste it and like it? And so um, especially, so here again, the red are the, cyan oops, the cyanobacterial mats and the green are the regular algae. So they like regular algae, especially the parrotfish, but they're still biting a lot of the mats. So these parrotfish are taking like 15 bites in a row. The um, angelfish are taking up to over 30 bites in a row of the mats. Um, so that's pretty cool. Compare it to right, like sediment, which is just sand. All right, it seems like parrotfish will just eat anything, right? They're eating sand. Um, but the French angelfish are not. They eat like one bite and they're like, no, that was gross. I'm not coming back. Same with coral, right? So we can tell that there are things they don't like and there are things that they do like. Um, so we think that they're learning to use these as a resource. And so um, fish actually are, even though they're not directly or I'm not showing you here, they're directly affected by ocean acidification, right? They're not making a calcium carbonate shell that's dissolving or anything, um, but they're learning how to use this new food source that's being fertilized by ocean acidification. Um, and so their response at the ecosystem scale is still an ocean acidification response and it's controlling it. So it's leading to resilience in the system. Um, so I'll pause for a second, see if anyone has questions. Yeah, so we have one from um, Charlotte who, that asks, are harmful algal blooms one genus of algae species? Are the HABs in the freshwater ecosystems of the same genus and species as the HABs in the saltwater ecosystems? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, there's actually all kinds of harmful algae. Um, I couldn't even tell you how many species or, or genera. Um, it's going to be dozens of, of genera and, and probably hundreds of species. Um, so they're not the same, but they, they work very similarly. And something else that's interesting about all of these HABs 
is that there's um, some of them are there all the time, um, but they're not harmful all the time. So when they're there at really low abundance and low amounts, um, they're just normal algae and they can actually be a really important food source for other like fish or snails or whatever living in that body of water. Um, it's when they go into a bloom condition that they start making all those toxins and then that's what makes them harmful. Um, so there, there's always the potential of them becoming harmful if they're in the ecosystem, but um, almost every body of water just normally under healthy conditions has some of those species there, just they're being well behaved. And then do um, previous blooms stimulate new blooms? Does it have any sort of positive feedback effect? We don't know. That's a really good question. And that's like a, an active research question um, that a lot of people are working on. Um, we don't know. So some algae um, reproduce by making, not all of them, but some of them reproduce by making spores that can live in the sediment, sort of like a seed bank in a forest. And so, um, yeah, what we don't know, we're really bad at predicting harmful algal blooms, which is, it seems like it should be surprising, right? But I think that part of it is that they can be driven directly by, oh, there's a low abundance of something that has the potential to be harmful. And then when you put all the right fertilizers in, it blooms and becomes harmful. And then there's another aspect that has to do with, um, like temperature and ocean currents sort of incubating the spores in the sediments. And that's the part that we don't understand as well. And that can then, when those sort of hatch um, uh, out, which is not the technical term for it, but when they, they germinate and they, they go into an active part of their life phase, um, that's the part that we don't understand as well. And that can generate another bloom. Um, and that, that's the part that could have like a carryover from a previous bloom. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Are all of you applying to graduate school? <laughs> I know really one, of the, one of them is in school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's see. All right. So I actually had some some sort of prompts or polls for discussion. Um, and if any of you have have questions, you know, I'm happy to 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 talk more about these. We've already had some great questions about harmful algal blooms, but I know there's a lot of other stuff going on in these systems. And so um, if you wanted to talk about any of those other ones, um, I'm happy to, um, or I, and I, I can sort of keep, keep talking um, if no one's taking my bait. Well, I would like to, to prompt you with the same question. What do you believe? Do you believe algal blooms are you know, some of the most harmful things that climate change affects? Yeah, I do because they, they touch so many things. So I talked a lot about coral reefs here in the context of algal blooms, but um, right, they affect in freshwater, they affect our drinking water um, reservoirs, which is pretty scary. Um, and they also affect fisheries. So they'll affect aquaculture, which is, so I'll just back up a little bit. So fisheries are a lot of the natural fisheries are overfished and so they're not doing so hot and when you have something like a harmful algal bloom or you just can't you can't fish anything and actually a lot of the fish will die um, and you can't eat the shellfish for a few weeks you know that really harms not just that food supply in terms of food but it harms the fishing industry itself um, and that's really bad but they also will harm aquaculture which is sort of our answer right to um, oh, we don't get as much food from fisheries, but we can do this aquaculture um, that doesn't deplete natural stocks, but they're all in the same water and so they all get affected. And so I think that to me, harmful algal blooms are really important for that reason that they, um, they link to a lot of, of other socioeconomic services that we get from the ocean. Yeah. And so one comment that I hear a lot is that the uh, effects of climate change that affect humans the most are going to be the ones that we pay the most attention mm -hmm. to. Um, you and I spoke briefly before we went live about the biofilm that exists kind of on top in the, mm -hmm. in these algal blooms. Is there any sort of way that these blooms could produce 
more bacteria or something that would be more harmful to us? Or is there like some sort of mutation rate that they have? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so I don't know. I actually don't know the answer to how quickly the, the algae mutate. Um, I would guess that they probably don't because we're so unable to control them that there's not um, selection pressure on them to change what they're doing because they're they're doing great and they're not really experiencing any hurdles. Um, like you mentioned, and I think I mentioned really briefly when I was talking about the different colors that the blooms can have, they um, they live in little communities and they're like bacteria and viruses and other things associated with them. And that's what helps them self-sustain. So when you get a bloom, in 2018 in Florida, we had a bloom that lasted, I think like 13 months or something super crazy. Um, we usually get a bloom in the summer that lasts for maybe a month, maybe two months, and it just didn't go away. And part of that is because when they're in that community, algae will use up, just like us, right? They're using up all their nutrients and usually the bloom dies when they're out of food and nutrients. Um, but in those communities, when they have bacteria, bacteria can fix nitrogen, they can fix phosphorus, all the things um, that the algae then will want to eat. Um, and then the algae are photosynthesizing and feeding their bacteria friends. And so they can sort of self-sustain for a long time. So we're starting to look more at who else is living in there with the algae um, and how that affects the longevity of the bloom. Um, and yeah, that's a very, it's sort of a scary thing. <laughs> do, um, all, do all coastal areas experience algal blooms or even if they're of different type? Yes, um, so the, the HAB blooms are more common in warmer water. Um, but they can happen, you know, Canada gets red tide um, and it shuts down their mussel and oyster industry and lobster. Um, so you can, you can get it even in very cold water. It just doesn't happen as often and they're less likely, you know, to persist for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, great questions. <laughs> and then on our... Um, chat, it says that the ones of most interest are ocean acidification and nutrient pollution. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, ocean acidification, I guess you can tell is sort of my <laughs> um, a pet topic of mine, because I think it, it has so many far reaching effects, right? So when we started talking about algae and like pollution and whatever, um, all that is actually an indirect effect of both ocean acidification and nutrient pollution that are acting together to fertilize that. And so all these like little chemical shifts um, can really have far reaching um, repercussions. And with ocean acidification, I have, I guess, a depressing factoid <laughs> um, for you, but uh, gas is most soluble in water when the water is cold. And so most out of the whole ocean, we're mostly absorbing CO2 and, and every other part of air um, in, in the Arctic regions and polar oceans. And the way that the circulation works so that it gets absorbed, like picture near Greenland, it gets absorbed and then it goes into deep water circulation, goes all the way around the planet. And then 250 years later, it comes up on the coast of between Alaska and Baja California, and then down in um, like Chile, Argentina. So what we're seeing, like with the mussels that I showed you from Washington state, that water is 250 years old. So um, if we were to just like stop everything right now, we actually have 250 years of ocean acidification left to sort of work out of the system. Um, so that's sort of depressing and like, you know, it's tempting to say, well, why would I do anything? Because it's, you know, obviously the last 250 years we've produced even more CO2 and it's just going to run away with us. Um, so I'll give you another nugget of hope is that ocean acidification by itself, it's bad, but it's not that bad, right? Everything I showed you with the algae was ocean acidification plus temperature and nutrients and other stuff. And so 
nutrients that has like an immediate effect within a year. If you change nutrient outputs, even within a matter of weeks, you'll see the algae respond because they won't have food anymore. And the same with temperature. Uh, most of the temperature changes we're seeing are due to like the immediate atmospheric accumulation of CO2. And so if we just let plants start to take care of that, it will draw down um, within decades. And so the, that'll decouple those other things from ocean acidification. And it actually, you know, it's, it's not all like everything is terrible and, um, and we might as well just throw in the towel because we've got 250 years built up. Um, it's just ocean acidification in particular um, is kind of a, a depressing one. Well, yes, thank you for the hope nugget. We did <laughs> hope nugget. that. Yeah, the hope nugget was very important to follow up with that back. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also, this may be kind of a silly question, but um, is nutrient pollution when we uh, like ruin our nutrient source or is it when we pollute our nutrients into the ecosystem? That's a fantastic question. Yeah, it's when we put stuff into the ecosystem. Um, so a good example is actually the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the Mississippi River gets in its drainage basin is most of the agricultural areas like the Midwest. Um, and so there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in that, in the, that river water, um, which affects the river. And then it also affects the Gulf of Mexico where it comes out. And so you can see a lot of fisheries effects um, and a lot of uh, sort of the Louisiana coast gets harmful algal blooms every year um, and they get what's called a dead zone, um, which is where the, the algae are so, so dense and so bad that all the fish and everything um, die because there's no oxygen. Um, it's sort of counterintuitive, right? You're like, it's algae, it should be producing oxygen. Um, but when the bloom dies and it, all the algae starts to decompose at the same time, that uses up all the oxygen and then nothing else can live there. So that happens every year. Uh, every year there's like this big, um, here I'm on the Gulf Coast now, we've got this big prediction every year of like how big is the dead zone gonna be? Um, and sometimes it lasts just a few weeks and other times it lasts like the whole summer. Um, but that's all a consequence of, of the nitrogen that comes out um, from our crops and stuff. So um, so yeah. the, the dead zone is the result of like they're suffocating. It's a lack yeah. of oxygen. It's not okay. So, well, I I used to think it was from like the talk like the toxins. You know, like I used to think they got sick or something. But it's so that contributes to it. Yeah. Okay. So that when the algae is alive, they produce toxins, and that can harm the fish. And then the fish die and start decomposing, and then the algae dies and starts decomposing, and all the bacteria that decompose use up all the oxygen, and then like. It's like this run of then everything dies. Um, and then once it's all gotten sort of processed and decomposed, everything goes back to normal. Yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a fun little conveyor belt that happens every year. Um, but yeah, so, some years it's 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 actually very hard to predict um, exactly um, how it will go. Um, but there's a, a nugget of hope with that too, is that they're actually starting to develop. So a lot of the runoff comes in the winter when um, right, the crops are not growing. And so there's no roots that keep the soil in place. And they're actually developing um, perennial wheat. So it'll have a root system that stays over the winter um, and hold, helps to hold that dirt in place. And it's actually the farmers like it too, because then they don't have to spend, like they don't love buying all this fertilizer that runs off every winter. Um, it's sort of demoralizing for them too, right? And so they like the idea of having something perennial that'll hold their dirt in um, and hold their nutrients in too. So it's sort of some of these new agricultural developments are super exciting and definitely a win-win, I think. I would also be interested to hear a little bit about how you feel um, with the progression of climate change in the, the, you know, the past few years and the progression of the research that's come out with it. Do you feel like your state of Florida or at least other coastal areas, have you seen progression in how they're handling it? Yeah, Florida is a very interesting place um, because I think people are very concerned about it. Um, it's been affecting with all the, the hurricanes we've had yearly recently, people are thinking very much about sea level rise. Um, and um, there's, you know, there's, 
we have stricter building codes, I think, in Florida um, because of that than a lot of other states. Um, but even some of those buildings have been um, have been suffering <laughs> with um, with water levels rising and things. Um, so people are building up things like coastal defenses and sea walls and whatever. Um, what we actually need to do um, is not build right on the edge of the water um, and build a little bit back. And actually think how nice your view would be. You'd have these beautiful dunes with grass and water and whatever, but no one is going to be like, oh, my multi-million dollar building that's right here on the coast, like I'm going to just like vacate that and move back, you know, like a half mile from the shore so that the issue of how to actually make that happen is um, it's very difficult and probably linked to all sorts of like FEMA politics that I don't even, you know, want to know about. Um, it's probably very complicated, but um, but th that's what people are talking about in Florida, especially is people are are worried um, and and thinking about it. But then there's also these big financial costs to doing something about it. And so that's I think that's where you get some denial that's maybe, you know, if I owned one of those buildings, I'm, I might be in denial too. Um, so yeah, that's where it becomes very tricky. Um, and I think all along the east, eastern seaboard, people have been experiencing more flooding and, and are concerned about coastal erosion and, um, and sea level rise as well. And this question yeah. kind of goes back to, to your um, own research when you mentioned that uh, most vertebrates don't eat the algae, except for those four or five fish or six fish mm -hmm. that you mentioned, um, d how, how long have we known that they eat the algae? Like, when did you guys figure that out? Uh, last January. Oh, wow. Okay. So like super, super recent. So we don't, yeah. do you know if it's a habit yet or if it's something that like, have you, have, I might've missed the conclusion on that, but do we know if they're sure. eating it consistently? Yes. So sorry. Yes. So they are. And actually by last January, I mean, January, 2019, um, it's like 2020 didn't happen, except that's uh, really not true. Um, it just feels like it's, it's March, but it has been a, a bad, long, bad month. Um, yeah. So we noticed that in January, 2019, and then we spent all of summer 2019 following up on it. Um, and yeah, it actually turns out that there are even more fish that are eating it. Um, and they, it does seem to be preferred. What's interesting is that the ones who like it the most also eat things like sponges. Um, sponges have lots of weird chemicals in them. Um, they're actually, they're used for a lot of like pharmaceutical products and beauty products. Um, so um, we've always known that sponges have weird chemicals and that things eat them. Um, and so I guess it kind of makes sense that the, the things eating the mats that have these toxins in them are already uh, maybe immune to the effects of whatever is coming out of the sponges. Um, they're sort of adapted to that. Is that um, a nugget of hope? Yeah, I think so. Um, so actually, one thing that we're trying to, we're working with the National Parks in Bonaire um, to... Um, and this is work that my student is leading, my student Ethan Sissel, um, and he, he's testing out. So if you go out and you you see a bloom um, and you pick a piece, just like with your hand, like you pick a piece out as if you were a fish taking a bite out of it, um, that seems to accelerate like degradation of the whole mat. And so he did that a bunch of times out in Bonaire and saw that when he did that, the mats are more likely to just sort of dissolve on their own, even if he didn't go back and pick at them. It's, it's like it triggers like a death of the of the community. And so we're actually now talking to the um, NOAA Marine Sanctuary in the Florida Keys about testing it there. Um, so they're the fish community in the Keys. The, the Keys just have a lot of problems um, because there's been so much human interaction with the reefs there. And so there are no fish eating them in the Keys. And so we're trying to um, set up tests of the same thing where we could go in and have like any, you know, divers, just normal people diving. Um, hey, if you happen to swim by one of these mats, just go and like pinch out like a, an inch out of the middle. Um, and if you, there are a lot of divers in the Keys. And so, if, you know, you just try and educate people that that's something that they could do. Um, that could be really important and potentially easy. Um, 
for for folks to implement. So that's one thing that we're working on. Uh, we meant to test it this summer, um, but we didn't. Uh, we're actually at Florida State. We're not allowed to travel outside of our, our county right now um, and since <laughs> since March. Um, so we're about a 10 hour drive from the Florida Keys. Um, a nervous laugh that goes along with that. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Uh, so maybe next year uh, we'll be able to do that. Yeah, well, that, that was super great. I will let you go because we are about to hit 1130 and I don't want All right, to- All right, sorry, everyone, I'm a talker. Was, this was so <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Thank you, thank you so much for inviting me and thanks for, for tuning in. <laughs> All right, have a good afternoon, bye. Thank you, bye.